as a student, particularly in high school, I was not what you would call a, an involved student. You guys know what an involved student is. Some of you were probably involved students. So whether it was student government or some you know, club or an extracurricular, like you were involved. If you were in sports, you were probably you know, the captain, uh, captain of the, the, or the, is that what they call them, the captain? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's also, I th for some reason I thought there might have been another name there. Um, but some of you were probably really involved students. This is how involved I got. My sophomore year of high school, I ran cross country one year. That was it. That was like as involved as I got in high school. So at least I had that going for me, right? One of those cross country studs. All the ladies, like, you know, were really into the cross country, the short shorts, envy of all the guys. Like, that was me. That was... Okay, so maybe not, maybe not, but uh, I did get involved at least in, in cross country, and I just continued the non-involvement even in my college years, uh, at least the first year, I just, I just didn't get involved. Um, I didn't start getting involved until my sophomore year, and I've told a little of this story before. Um, I had a resident director come to me and was explaining to me how he saw some leadership potential in me, which is always nice to hear, but then what he suggested next was that I get involved in what was referred to as a peer advisor role. And he just asked, you know, are you interested in doing something like that? I was like, no, no, I'm not interested at all in doing something like that. And then he mentioned, he mentioned that there was a, a small scholarship if you were accepted into the program. I was like, well, now we're talking? Like, now I'm totally interested, right? Money's involved? Yes, for sure. So I, I signed up and filled out the application, and sure enough, I was selected to be a peer advisor. Now, what does a peer advisor do? Quite a few things, but the one that, the one that was pretty intimidating was we actually became college professors. No kidding, we were actually responsible in like creating the curriculum and also presenting the material uh, for a freshman's life skill class. Now, now, granted, just to give the school that I went to a little bit of accreditations cred, for it, um, Monday and Wednesday, like they actually had a, a real professor leading the class. But Fridays, Fridays were our peer advisor role. That's when we came in and we taught different things that we thought the students, freshman students might enjoy, might actually get something out of, like how not to fall asleep when you're studying and reading and those type of like hard hitting things that every you know, freshman needs. But let me ask you, do you think, coming from my background of not really getting involved much, uh, and now suddenly I am a college professor, do you think I felt qualified for that role? To teach and to lead? Do you think I was like definitely the, the, the wisest person on campus at that point? No, I felt like a complete fraud, a uh, complete phony. Later on that year, I, again, you guys have heard this story before, but I felt God was leading me to start a youth ministry at the church I was attending. The church was only about a year and a half old, didn't have a youth ministry, and so we got this youth ministry started. Do you think that at the age of 19 that I was ready, prepared, and felt so confident now being a youth pastor? Think I felt that way? This is how bad it was, guys. It was so bad I realized I needed something to have some sort of street cred with the parents, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe if I just looked older, that would help. And so I thought, well, you know, the best way to look older is growing some facial hair. So I decided I was gonna grow some facial hair. And at the time, like, nothing was cooler than the goatee. Like, the goatee was like the fashionable, like, that's what every hip, like, pastor was doing. So here's the thing. There's no photos because I couldn't grow a goatee. <laughs> so I did what I thought was the next best thing, because I could grow some seriously sick sideburns. I mean, I could grow them really long and bushy. So that's exactly what I did. So do you think this, this helped with the street cred that I had with the parents? No, I just looked like the creepy guy who's got like these really gross long sideburns. My wife and I, Dana, we got married shortly after we graduated college, and a year and a half after that, we found ourselves in ministry overseas in a country called Eswatini, Africa, and one of the roles that we had was actually to, to lead these child and head of households. Uh, they had lost their parents due to HIV and AIDS, and so we were doing our best to get them to a point where they could be self-sufficient. And one of the, uh, I mean, again, at the age of, you know, like 24, do you think I was ready to be a parent, even though I hadn't had kids myself, and we've got, you know, families of three and five and six, and they're all looking to us as mom and dad, do you think I was ready for that role? One of the families, the Gunene family, they actually referred to us, if they were introducing us to friends, they actually referred to us as father and mother. 
So if we were in town and you know someone came up and you know introduced themselves and like, oh yeah, no, this is my this is our father. This is Southern Africa, by the way. So so the skin tone alone, like you know, there's clearly going to be some weird looks. Like this this is your father, you know. And I was just a kid myself, trying to lead other kids to be self-sufficient. Do you think I was ready for that leadership role? Do you feel, think I felt so qualified for that, that leadership role? No, definitely not. Complete, phony, fake, you know, that's the feelings that I had. Now, the reason why I'm telling you these stories is because I think sometimes this is just how we oftentimes feel when we find ourselves in leadership roles and having responsibility. I think there are some of us that we just feel, we feel too young. Like, how can I lead? when I'm at this age and I haven't had you know, this sort of training before. Uh, others of us, we feel too old. You think, well, yeah, maybe 20 years ago, people might actually follow me, but are, is anyone really going to listen to me? I, am I a leader anymore? And we, we have these ideas in our heads that maybe we're not, and sometimes we actually do have a, a sense of leadership. Maybe it's because at work, you've got a title or maybe you have gotten some sort of degree, and so you're thinking, yeah, definitely, I, I, I definitely can lead in this area. But then when it comes to leadership in other parts of your life, you're like, no. Leadership in the church? No, no, that's not me. Leadership in the community? No, 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 that's for other people. Leadership in, in the neighborhood? I, no. Maybe my home, because I'm a mom, I'm a dad, maybe there, but not, not everywhere. But what I want you guys to understand, and where we're gonna be heading today in the next several weeks is, if you are a follower of Christ, and if you're not, it, it, we're just glad that you're here, but if you are a follower of Christ, you are actually called to leadership. Like Jesus has actually commissioned you to be a leader wherever he has you. We see this throughout scripture. I think it's most evident in Matthew chapter 28. We refer to this oftentimes as the Great Commission. What does Jesus say in Matthew 28? He says, go, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And he's going to be with us while we do it. What are we hearing here? You are a leader. What are you, what are you doing? What are you leading them? You're actually influencing them closer to Jesus. In fact, I read to you guys um, this verse last week, just kind of preparing you for the new series that we're in. But uh, this is a quote from John Maxwell. He defines leadership this way. I think it's really interesting. He says, leadership is helping others achieve a common vision uh, or goal through a positive influence. What are you doing? You're, you're helping people achieve a common goal or vision through positive influence. <clears throat> so if you have a relationship with even just one other person, can you influence them positively? Can you lead them? The answer is yes. We all have that ability. Now, Jesus sets the goal. He sets the vision. What is the goal? What is the vision? You are positively influencing people to him. That's the goal. That's the vision. And so we're starting today a new series in the book of Titus. This is a small three-chapter book in the New Testament that many of you may have overlooked because it is just so small. But it is a master class in leadership. And we feel so strongly about this here at our church that we've actually built leadership into one of our core values. Like We want you guys to be growing in your leadership, in your positive influence of people towards Jesus. What is our fourth core value? You may or may not know this, but our fourth core value is that we train up leaders in God's truth. Why? To change the world. We build up. We train up leaders in God's truth to change the world. And so again, for this reason, we're going to be looking at this master class of of, of leadership in Titus because we've got the Apostle Paul, who's an amazing leader, who is writing to another amazing leader in the early church named Titus, whose job and task it is to actually train up other leaders in the church. So that's where we're headed. Let me give you a little bit, bit of background, uh, a little bit of history on the book of Titus itself. We read in verse 4 of Titus <clears throat> that Paul actually refers to Titus in a unique way. He says, my true son and our common faith. This has actually led some people to believe that maybe the Apostle Paul even led Titus to Christ at some point. We know that Paul is this amazing missionary, and so maybe on one of his missionary journeys, uh, this Greek kid named Titus was presented the gospel message and received it, and he became a Christian. We don't know for sure, but it, it seems pretty nice to at least imagine it, that, that it took place that way. Uh, we have way more information on the Apostle Paul than we do the individual Titus. However, in the New Testament, we see the name Titus, specifically this guy Titus, coming up multiple times, and each time it comes up, leadership is part of who he is. 
uh, one of the first times that it shows up is actually in the book of Acts. So Acts is kind of the history of the early church and the Holy Spirit's work in the early church. And one of the things that we see is the Apostle Paul, he goes to Jerusalem and he has this meeting with really important first century church leaders, individuals like Peter, individuals like James, the half-brother of Jesus. And one of his goals is just to share with them what's happening when it comes to leading Gentiles, non-Jewish people, to Christ. And one of the things that Paul emphasizes is that the law given to Moses is not actually what saves us. It doesn't bring us into a right relationship with God. It's actually, it's actually grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And he points to Titus to say, and, and here's our example of this. So if you would, go ahead and turn to Galatians, because in Galatians chapter 2, Paul is going to give a little bit of explanation of this meeting. And we'll get into Titus eventually, but I, I just wanted to see, let you guys see the importance of, of Titus's work, um, not just this letter, but in other parts of the Bible. So in Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul's going to describe this meeting a bit. And he says, then, then, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along, along also. I went in response to a revelation in meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet, not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. Okay, we're going to stop reading there. And some of you are like, okay, I didn't, I didn't see that coming. Like, the, the first two verses were kind of making sense, and then there was like this hard left, like... What's this whole talk about circumcision? And can we even talk about that in the church? Well, yes, it's in scripture, so we're going to talk a little bit about it. You have to understand, picture the scene. Titus is invited by Paul to this meeting in Jerusalem. And so he enters this meeting with all these important Jewish Christians. Jewish Christians who understood that circumcision is a really important part of their covenant relationship with God. Because it was the outward sign, outward evidence of God's choosing them as his people. Yet Titus shows up and he's this uncircumcised Greek. What do you do with this kid? And Paul points to him and says, hey, this is actually the work of the good news. This is the work of the gospel. So again, picture the scene. Titus shows up at this meeting, an uncircumcised Greek, and he leaves the meeting, an uncircumcised Greek. So I would think both theologically and physically, probably a Pretty good day for Titus, right? Maybe just a little bit. I'm not going to go into all the inner workings of why this is such a big deal, but it's one of those moments that really shapes where the early church goes from here, particularly when it comes to bringing the good news to the Gentile people. And who's at the center of it? Like, who's right in the mix of all this? Titus. Titus is. But what is he doing? He's positively influencing those around him. One of the other places that we see Titus show up is with the church in Corinth. So if you know anything about the church in Corinth, pretty dysfunctional church. Uh, they've got a lot of problems. And what Paul does is he actually sends Titus to them. Why is he sending Titus to them? To, them? to positively influence them, to actually lead them back to, to right doctrine. He's a leader. However, probably the most challenging position that Titus ends up having, at least that we have recorded in Scripture, is his work on the island of Crete. So we've got a picture of the island of Crete here. Crete is actually the largest Greek island in the Mediterranean Sea, or at least the uh, Aegean Sea. And, uh, and one of the things that's really unique about Crete is, well, several things are really unique. One, it appears as though the gospel reached this island relatively soon in the first century. And there's a lot of ideas as to why this is the case. One of them is that after the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came on the early church and Peter went out and the other disciples and they preached the first gospel, well, what do we learn? 3,000 end up coming to faith in Christ. There's a huge crowd, though. And we see in Scripture that part of that crowd is actually people from Crete. And so the idea is maybe they heard this message and they went back to the island and they established these churches. Do we know this for sure? No, but it's very plausible. What we do know, though, is on this island, there are about six really critical ports 
And so trade came in and out of Crete all the time. And you can see how central it is to this area, not only Asia, but also Europe. And if you can't see, this is you know, the end of Rome, uh, right there with the boot, Italy at least. And, uh, and so this is a really central part. And so the idea, the thinking is, if you're a missionary, if, if we can get the gospel to really take roots here on this island, and you've got all this trade and all these seafaring people that can now take the gospel to other places, man, the gospel could really spread and spread fast. And so it's most certainly, that's probably why Paul ends up on this island. And who does he bring with us, with him on this island? Titus is who he brings. Now, they begin to either establish some churches or at least make sure that those that have already been established are healthy. And eventually then, Paul leaves to do his other missionary work, but he leaves Titus there as the key leader with one responsibility, to train up others in the church to lead and to lead well. This is not an easy task, though, because Crete, Crete's a sketchy place. So for hundreds of years, Crete had a reputation that if you wanted to like, have a gun for hire, you, you, go to the, you go to Cretans. They were paid mercenaries. Like This was their reputation. And so their cities were violent places. Not only that, but sexual immorality ran rampant. And this was just a really difficult place. In fact, um, Cretans believed that Zeus was born on the island, and they loved to tell stories of Zeus's underhanded tactics they love to tell stories about how he seduced women and how he cheated and deceived in order to get his way. And they love to tell these stories because that's how they wanted to live their life and that's how they did live their life. And so this actually starts to influence the culture of the church and Titus has a job of fixing this thing. That's a tough job. If you've ever tried to change the culture, particularly a negative culture in an environment, that's hard. That's Titus's responsibility. And if you've ever had a tough leadership responsibility before, you know that it's, it's kind of fun maybe to point fingers at all the problem people that is, is keeping you from leading and leading well. Have you ever been there before? Maybe you're working with a team and it's like, if it wasn't for this guy, like this guy can't get his act together, doesn't even show up on time. If it wasn't for her, man, she's just always running her mouth. Oh, would she stop the gossip, right? If this person would finally have some, like embrace our core values, like, and we like to point the finger at everyone else's being the problem. John Maxwell, and this is my last John Maxwell quote, by the way, has a little wisdom on this. He says, if I could kick the person responsible for my problems, how many of you have ever wanted to kick the person responsible for your problems? Just give him a, you know? Okay, so he says, if I could kick the person responsible for my problems, I wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. See what he did there? He knows, he knows that oftentimes, if, if we're gonna lead and lead well, well, it starts with us. In fact, this is where we're headed today. What we're gonna be doing is looking at how your leadership potential, your leadership potential is directly related to how well you lead yourself. I'm gonna say it again. Your leadership potential is directly linked with how well you are currently leading yourself. And I know that leads us to the big question. Well then how? How do we lead ourselves well? Before we even get into answering that question, I just want you to think through for a moment, who are the leaders that have influenced you positively? Chances are, when you look at those individuals, they're leading themselves really well. And, and those that have maybe done you wrong and caused some scars in your life, they haven't led, led themselves very well. I mean, just think through that. Think about the people who have, have really impressed you. They're probably the people who have been disciplined, they're probably individuals who have integrity and character, who actually lead with vision and purpose. Because what happens when you see leaders like that? Your respect for them grows, and at the same time, you want to follow them because you trust them. But on the other hand, if you've ever had someone over authority over you who is leading, but leading in a negative way, that they're not actually disciplined, they're not actually leading with integrity and character or vision and purpose, what happens? Your respect for them plummets, your trust for them plummets, and you don't want to follow them. And so again, that, that question that we need to ask ourselves is, well then how can we, how can we actually lead ourselves well enough that we can actually lead others? How can we positively influence others for Christ? Well, the good news is the book of Titus has some answers for you. So if you haven't gotten there yet, go ahead and turn to Titus chapter 1. That was a bit of background. We're not going to do that every week, but hopefully you've got a better understanding of where 
we're going with Titus and what some of the, the historical background is. So Titus chapter 1, we're going to start reading verse 1, and we're not going to get very far because what we're going to see is one of the foundational principles to leading yourself well. It begins, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Okay. He's not said a whole lot, but he's said a whole lot. In fact, this is the first foundation, I think, for leading yourself well in any situation. What do we see Paul doing? Paul has developed his leadership identity. What is the first foundational element that you need to implement if you're going to lead yourself well? You have to know your leadership identity. You have to develop your leadership identity. What has Paul said? Two words to describe himself. He said that he is a servant and he's also an apostle. Now it almost seems like those are in contrast with each other. You know, you've got a servant, they're pretty low, but apostle sounds like that's pretty cool. So what, what does he mean, servant and apostle? Well, the servant, what does the servant do? Servant is basically responsible for his master's bidding. Master says, do something, that's what you got to do. Does anyone want that position? I don't think most of us do. That's a lowly position and envy of no one. But what do we see the apostle Paul describing himself as throughout his letters? constantly referring to himself as a servant. I'm a servant. I'm a servant. I mean, he fully embraces that as his identity. Why? Well, it all depends on who's his servant. It, or, sorry, who's his master. And his master is his father. His master is God. His master is his Lord. And so when God speaks, when the Lord speaks, what does he do? He is obedient, and he wants to be nowhere else than in God's obedient direction. So he is a servant, number one. Second, he's an apostle. What does the word apostle mean? It actually means to be sent or sent one. So he recognizes his identity is that he's a messenger, or better yet, he's an ambassador. That's pretty cool. I mean, if you had that on your job uh, resume, that you're an ambassador in the United States, I mean, that'd be pretty, pretty great. But who's he an ambassador of and for? Well, it's of Christ. He is being sent specifically to the Gentiles. In fact, in Galatians, the book that we just read out of, he explains how Christ commissioned him to be an apostle specifically to non-Jewish people. Now, when you understand your identity, you're able to lead from that identity. And this is what's so critical. So many people, this is the problem that I see, not just in the church, not just like with, with Christians, but I see this oftentimes even in my own life. We hear the Great Commission, we read about the Great Commission, we recognize that this is important, but we don't actually identify ourselves as actually having that role and responsibility. You ever found yourself doing that? You know, maybe it's just the, the simple explanation that, well, you know, I, I don't have the training to be a pastor. And so when it comes to, like, leading people to Jesus, that's for the paid staff of the church. Or when you think of evangelists, you're like, well, I'm no, I'm no Apostle Paul. I mean, he went, he went to that country and this country, and he knew exactly what to do and what to say. I'm not, I'm not an Apostle Paul. And so what do we do? We just assume that that's a leadership responsibility for someone else. What did Jesus teach us, though? What has Jesus called us to do? He's called us to positively influence others to him. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded. This is our identity. If you are in Christ, this is who you are. It's not just something you get to do. It's actually who you are. And so what I'd like to do um, is just kind of walk through a little exercise with you. And as I, well, you know what, let me hold on to this just for a second. It, just recognize that you have a name tag down below. Um, you're going to use that in just a second, and you'll need a pen, but we've got pens in the chairs and seat in front of you. But let me give you just one word or a couple words of encouragement when it comes to really being able to identify yourself as a leader who positively leads others to Christ. It's going to help you guys stand taller. Number one, you're going to stand taller. Does that mean you walk around with arrogance? No, I'm so much better than these people who don't have this leadership calling. No, that's not what it is. But you have a sense of responsibility. You have a sense of purpose. And your responsibility and your purpose isn't something that's just going to bear fruit here and now, but it's going to bear fruit in eternity. I mean, doesn't that make you stand a little taller? Like That's your role. That's your responsibility. That's how you're going to impact the world around you. That makes me stand a little taller. Not only will it help you stand taller, I think it will allow you to actually begin to, to think higher. As Christians, 
sometimes we just have, we don't have higher thinking. Some of you right now in this moment, you're thinking, I just need to keep my eyelids open. I get it, I get it. Like that, that happens, like late night partying it up. I know you guys love your Saturday nights and it's probably gotten a little wild. And, and that's where your thinking is. Let me tell you, as a Christian, that's not higher thinking. Some of you are thinking, Oh, gosh, you know, lunch this afternoon. Man, I hope we were able to visit, you know, whatever burger place. So that, that, that's not higher thinking. Some of you are like, if I get this done and that done, maybe I can have a Sunday afternoon nap. That's, that's not higher thinking. You know what? When you have your identity in Christ as someone who positively influences those to Jesus, you start to think higher than those things. You actually start thinking, you know what? I haven't met that person that's two rows in front of me, and I don't know if they've really connected well here in our church And so you know what I'm going to do? As soon as Jonathan stops yapping, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to actually reach out to them and invite them deeper into our Christian community so that they feel loved and supported. Guys, that's that's higher thinking, built around your identity in Christ. Higher thinking is, you know, I can't wait. I can't wait till this sermon's over because then I get to go down and I get to work with the kids. I can't wait to go and chat it up with that crazy kid who's got all the weird questions and I don't even know how to answer them. But man, through your Holy Spirit, God, I'm going to do my best. That's higher thinking. Higher thinking is, I, have I actually adopted this identity of leading people to Christ into my workplace? And if I haven't, what does that look like? What does it look like in my school? What does it look like in my family? What does it look like in my neighborhood? And if I'm to positively influence people to Jesus, you know, starting tomorrow, what am I going to be doing to make that happen? That's higher thinking. It only happens when you know, when you've developed your leadership identity. So back to our name tags. Everybody grab one and hopefully a pen. If there's not enough pens, go ahead and share with the people next to you. But what I want you to do is kind of treat this as you walked into a conference and you got a name tag and the name tag says, hello, my name is, and you would write your name. I'd write Jonathan Gleason. Davis would write Davis Gleason. And you walk around and everyone would be able to identify you by your name. Now, we don't have ones that say, hello, my name is, and that's intentional. Because the first half of this name tag, you are going to write the leadership identity that you are going to be developing. Now, if you're not a Christian, you can write whatever you want. But if you are a follower of Jesus, I want to encourage you to write something to this effect. You might have to write a little small, because you're only going to be writing half of it. But I would encourage you to write something to this effect. If you're more poetic than me, have at it, get creative. But what I want you to to write is, I positively influence people to Jesus. That's your identity. You positively influence people to Jesus. Now, again, you might want to get more poetic and you say, okay, I save the lost and I disciple the saved. Or you might have something else that just resonates more with who you are as a person. But you need to begin to develop your, your leadership identity, and it starts with, what has Christ called you to? He's called you to positively influence others to Jesus. So while you write that down on your card, everybody's got pen, everyone's got a name tag, I'm going to continue reading the book of Titus, and I will allow you guys to uh, be filled in on what we're doing with this in just a second. All right, the Apostle Paul continues. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. To further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, and the hope of external, eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now, at his appointed season, he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. And everybody takes a deep breath. <sighs> My goodness, what did he just say, right? If you don't already know this, The Apostle Paul can pack more theological truth into one sentence than probably anyone else in Scripture. And this is just one of those prime examples of it. What I want to focus in on is how Paul has given us the second foundation of of really leading ourselves well. Not only do we develop our leadership identity, but we also begin to really determine what our leadership initiatives are. You develop your leadership identity, and then you begin to develop. You begin to define those leadership initiatives. Paul understands who he is, and he also has a mission for how to actually accomplish this identity in Christ. How does he say it? Well, he says it in kind of a lot of confusing jargon that takes a little while to start to understand, but let me try to explain what he said. We read here that 
he deepens the faith of his brothers and sisters in Christ. That's his leadership initiative. He wants to develop the faith of his brothers and sisters in Christ. He talks about sharing God's truth. And as a result of sharing God's truth, what's happening? People are actually growing in godliness, in truth. We see here that he, his mission is to preach. And his preaching, what is it doing? It's leading people to eternal life. Eternal life that's actually been promised by God from the beginning of time. So he's got his leadership identity, which is influencing his leadership initiatives. Let me ask you, based on your identity, in Christ, do you have any leadership initiatives? Have you set any leadership? Have you got any, have you got a clear mission for what Christ has called you to do when it comes to influencing people closer to Christ? I think so often we know what we should do, but we don't necessarily do what we should do. Some of you know you should take care of yourself. Part of taking care of yourself is getting enough sleep at night. And so you go to bed at a decent time, but then you tell yourself, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna check my socials for five minutes. Like, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna check for five minutes. And then, like, 55 minutes later, you're still looking at weird TikTok videos, right? And then that, because of that, you wake up and, you know, the alarm's blaring and you know you should just get out of bed, but what do you do? You decide to hit the snooze button. We know what we should do. We should eat healthy food, but you know what's better? We like to eat tasty food. Right? You know what you should do, but we don't often do it. Um, you know what you should do. You know you should exercise, but your couch, your couch is just way more comfortable than the treadmill, and so you stay on the couch instead. Like, we know what we should do, and I think this is true even when it comes to our our initiatives to lead and lead and influence others positively for Christ. I mean, even maybe even today, maybe some of you have had this experience. Well, we, there's a recognition that when you sing, when you praise, you should be paying attention to the words that you're singing. But you can't stop daydreaming about how handsome Josh is. Like, you just, you can't get it out of your head. It's a confession that, uh, that Bruce gives me, like, every single Sunday. I keep praying for him. You guys can start praying for him, too. But there's times where we know, we know that in our just our normal conversations with people that they need to center around Jesus. But what do we want to do? We want to complain about what's going on in politics. We want to complain about what's going on in popular culture. We know what we should do. We should actually be a part of corporate worship every single Sunday. We should be a part of a life group. But instead, what do we do? We're like, eh, eh, I'm not feeling it this, this morning. Eh, I'm going to pass on that one. I'll tell, I'll, I'll, I'll tell the pastor that I'm watching online. Some of you do watch online, and for everyone who is watching online, well done for watching online, but we're just looking at some of the numbers, and uh, all the people that tell me they're watching online based on the numbers, I, I don't know what's happening. But if you're watching online, well done, well done. Um, we know what we should do, but we don't necessarily always do it. So here's what I want to do. Grab your, grab your little name tag, again, and on the second half of this, I want you to write down at least one leadership initiative that you want to begin to define in your life. Based on your identity, that you're someone who positively leads people to Jesus, what is one initiative, what is one thing you can do to actually make that more of a reality? Is for some of you, and be really, really specific. You know, it might be one of those things where you're like, wow, I just, I just need a little bit more courage. That's not nearly specific enough. You need to get really specific. Courage in what? Courage in sharing your faith with that person that you've known for six years, but they don't actually know that you're a follower of Jesus? That might be a good start, yeah courage to share your faith with that person. Maybe it's courage to, to give generously because in the back of your mind, you're thinking, I don't know if I can trust God with my finances and so I want to hold on to it as much as I can. And you need to have courage to, to do that. Or maybe it's not courage. Maybe it's, it's just more consistency. Well, consistency with what? Be very, very specific. Consistency in reading your Bible and prayer every single day. Is it consistency in just once a week getting together as a family and having a time of devotion, prayer, studying? What do you want to get consistent about? Uh, maybe it's patience. Maybe you are one of those people that work in the children's ministry, and there's one kid specifically that you know really needs Jesus, and you need a ton of patience to positively influence that poor kid to Jesus because every single time you teach, they want to talk over you and you're about to strangle the kid, right? So you need patience. So maybe that's your leadership initiative. What is mine? As you guys write yours down, I'll share mine with you. I wasn't able to write the whole thing because um, mine's a little longer, but I've got transforming my mind. So currently, in this season of my life, what I'm working on is 
is focusing, training my mind to focus on what God thinks of me rather than being so concerned about what other people think. Over the last several months, I have just found my mind almost, it can be almost one of those minute by minute basis just being hijacked by what someone might think or what someone said and I'm not quite sure what they meant by that and I'm taking it maybe a different way than, and, and my mind just gets hijacked and I need to begin to train my mind to stop focusing on that and start focusing on what God thinks of me, what God has called me to. And so my leadership initiative is just transforming my mind. Write down your leadership initiative. Notice that I did not have you write 10. I didn't have you write five. I didn't even have you come up with two because my guess is one is gonna be hard enough. And if I can get you just to write down one, you have a greater chance of actually living it out. Guys, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write it down. And then what I want you to do is take that name tag and I do not want you to just plop it on your chest. Instead, what I want you to do is I want you to find a place in either your car or your house or your office where you could just put this up and every single day remind yourself, hello, my name is, and you are reminded of your leadership identity that you are developing. You can remember that leadership initiative that you're trying to define in your life. Because without a plan, guys, we're not gonna lead ourselves very well. And we certainly won't lead others. I began today by talking to you guys about you know, those different leadership roles that I started early, at least early in my college career, <clears throat> late in my student career. And every single leadership responsibility, I always just thought I was way over my head. Almost every single one of them. Never really walked in with a whole lot of confidence. It was more fear and trepidation. Um, each decision led to another leadership role and another leadership role and another leadership role. Until in 2019, those leadership roles actually led me eventually to be your senior pastor. And, and Heather, was, Heather was excited about it, which is great. Thank you, Heather. I appreciate that. Do you think that I felt ready, though? Like, I've done youth ministry before, but this was not a youth ministry gig. I've done college ministry, but this was not a college ministry. I've done children's ministry, but this was not a children's ministry. I've done outreach ministry, but this is not a, just an outreach ministry. This is a senior pastor role. Do you think I felt well qualified, ready to go? I was the voice of wisdom in all things Anderson Christian Church. Do you think I really felt that way? If you, if Bruce gives me way more credit than, uh, than he should. No, I had, this, I had this overwhelming thought in the back of my mind. And the overwhelming thought was, it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time before this church realizes they made a huge mistake and I'm not the guy for the job. <laughs> and some of you are shaking your head and saying, yep, it didn't take us very long at all. <laughs> Fair enough. But here's the thing. You know, whether you feel it or not, it, it doesn't really matter because Christ has called you to positively influence people to him. And I want to give you just one last word of encouragement. This comes at the very end of this little section, verse 4. Paul says to Titus, my true son in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. He says, grace, peace, go with you, Titus. I know this is a ch tough and a very challenging assignment, grace and peace go with you. And I think some of you, as you enter your work and you enter your home, maybe what you need is you need your name replaced. Maybe you need to put your name instead of Titus. What might this read like? Maybe put your name to Jonathan, to Heather. Put your name there. To my fellow brother and sister in our common faith. No grace and peace from our Father God and our Savior Jesus Christ rest on your life. So keep taking those steps of faith, leading others to Jesus. Keep taking those steps and watch what God will do. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us leadership responsibility. Father, it fills us with purpose. It fills us with significance. Father, so many of us, we just don't see ourselves as the right kind of people to positively influence others to you. Father, you don't just call the qualified. You qualify the called. And you've called us all to this work. And so, Father, may we surrender in, in obedience to you. I pray this in your son Jesus' name.